Well, hello and welcome to Christ Church. Uh, this week has brought the uh, sober news of the sad death of His Royal Highness Prince Philip. And I know on this Sunday, our thoughts and prayers are very much with the Queen and the rest of the Royal Family as they grieve. Um, looking back to uh, last week, a very big thank you to uh, everybody who helped us have such a wonderful and uplifting experience of Easter, including that great outdoor service we were able to have at 10.30. A big thank you to all those involved. Um, this, uh, this Sunday we'll be remembering the Royal Family in our prayers and uh, we will have services at uh, 8.30, at 10.30 and at 6.30. All of those services will both be online and in person as well. Um, earlier on I was chatting to Elona and Peter uh, about a pilgrimage that we are planning for this coming October. Um, a very warm welcome to uh, Sunday the 11th of April and our services today. We've got in-person and online services at 8.30, 10.30 and 6.30 tonight. And it's always great to see people either in person or online. So thank you for joining us. I've also got myself joined here by Alona and Peter who are helping me lead a pilgrimage to Israel from the 21st to 29th of October this year. I wanted to just ask them a few questions about that because you know we're all itching to travel um, but sometimes we may have questions on our mind about where we can go, what we can do and what we might benefit from. And uh, my first question actually is Ilona, you've been to Israel hundreds of times. Why why are you sort of going back? What sort of keeps drawing you back each year? Well, I love going to Israel. I've been all over pilgrimages and other places, Greece and all over Europe. But Israel's special because it brings the Bible alive and it makes the Bible so real and in a very spiritual dimension that when you read it after you've been, it comes out 3D. You just read it in a completely different way. That's brilliant. I mean, um, the, the world is, let's face it, sometimes it appears anyway on our television screens to be a sort of volatile place. Um, Peter, how safe is Israel as a place to visit? Well, Israel is uh, probably at the forefront of uh, inoculations for the coronavirus by comparison to the other countries, and so they take it very seriously. Uh, as far as other security goes, from the time we arrive at Ben Gurion Airport, uh, we are in safe hands. We use the same bus company that we used for many, many years. Uh, the hotels that we stay in are very safe, and as well as the boat that we travel on on the Sea of Galilee. Well, yeah, that's excellent. I can vouch for that. Certainly, I went with you on the last pilgrimage, and we felt as safe as houses. And uh, in fact, I think uh, some commentators says Israel is the safest country in the Middle East to visit. They take security very seriously, and of course, as you say, they've done very well with the pandemic. Um, I've just got maybe one last question. That's to you, Alona. What are you kind of particularly looking forward to uh, in terms of your visit this time? What, what sort of, you know, as you look forward to the visit, what are you looking forward to most? Well, I love to be with a new group and everything's fresh for them. And we go there and we go to the Sea of Galilee first. Just that first morning, their comments at breakfast after looking over the Sea of Galilee and seeing where Jesus walked on water and where he cured people, where he spent most of his ministry was the, around the Sea of Galilee. So I love doing that. And then I love going up to Jerusalem and seeing that beautiful holy city where Jesus died and rose again and it's just so special to be there and um, and so I just love to be with different groups different leaders and watch them and observe the way they teach and I learn so much from each one of them and I love that and we have Noel Tredinik as well as David and uh, and Rayed our um, Arab Christian um, leader as well. Oh, that's excellent. I'm looking forward to it uh, hugely as well. Looking forward to teaching the Bible on location. Um, we're quite close to deadline for applications, so if you could get them in this week, if you're thinking of coming, that would be absolutely brilliant. Full details on our website, and of course there are contact details there to talk to either myself, Alona, or Peter. Um, God bless. Good morning, Christchurch. My name is Bree. Just a little update for the kids' ministry and their families. Um, as we are allowed to worship in church following the WISE COVID guidelines, um, the kids' church will be meeting in the Point starting from next week, the 18th of April, and um, during the 10.30 morning service. Um, and we will have our very own kids' service. And um, so the drop-off will be um, in the junction if parents, they can meet us there, the kids, just so there's no back and forth through the church building. 
Um, so we'll be there in the junction waiting for kids. We'll take them up into the point and we'll have our own um, kids service. This won't look like our groups because our groups aren't really uh, COVID safe. So this will be done in a safe way, socially distant in our own household bubbles. Um, so we are looking forward to doing that and we're looking forward to all the measures we've got to put in place for that as well. Um, so this is also for ages 4 to 10. Um, so if you have children that are younger, you are welcome to join the rest of the church family in the service or um, join your own stream in the children's room there. So that's there for you as well. And uh, we hope to see you there soon. That's starting next week. See you soon. Well, a very warm welcome to our 10.30 service today. Wherever you are, whether at home in the parish or across the globe, it's lovely to be with you. We are all one church family. And I'm Terence Russoff, the curate here at Christchurch, and it's my pleasure to be leading the service today. And we begin with an opening prayer. So let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we lift up our world to you with all its troubles. But we know that you are a good God. You know you are a God that loves us. And we now just come before you to praise your mighty name and worship you together. Amen. Well, we now come to a time of confession. So let's just pause for a moment and just bring before the Lord those things for which we need to say sorry for and for ask his forgiveness. The Apostle Paul says, be imitators of God, love as Christ loved, put away all anger and bitterness, all slander and malice. So let us confess our sins to God who forgives us in Christ. And we say together, most merciful God, 
Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. And now hear this comforting assurance of God's forgiveness. May the God of love bring us back to himself, forgive us our sins, and assure us of his eternal love, in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And knowing God's forgiveness, let's say together this joyful anthem of praise from Psalm 100. And we stand as we say this. We say together. O oh, be joyful in the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that has made us, and we are his. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, and bless his name. For the Lord is gracious, his steadfast love is everlasting and his faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Well, we remain standing as we draw near to God in worship with two songs, recognising his presence with us. And as we enter into worship, some words from 1 Chronicles 16, verse 29. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendour of his holiness. Let's worship the Lord in song.
Let us pray. First of all, we pray for our world. O oh, loving God, we do pray for our world and we ask that you will bring peace to the nations of the world. Help them work together for the common good. And as we fight the pandemic, may there be sharing of vaccines, sharing of medical knowledge and resources and renewed economic activity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We cry out to you particularly for the people of Myanmar and for the work of Dr. Sasa of Help and Hope and we ask that you will protect and guide his every move. And we pray that you will bring peace to the nation and justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our own nation, particularly the royal family as it grieves the loss of his royal highness, Prince Philip and the queen. And we ask that you will comfort her in her sorrow and help the family as it grieves together in unity and in trust in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our church and our parish, and we ask that you, that you will help us to be bold in our witness, help us in our care for one another. We pray for our new MTs, our ministry trainees, as they plan to join us in September, and ask that you will prepare them as they seek to join the ministry here and play their part in the spread of the gospel. We pray also for our new curate, Nick Wolfe, arriving in June and ask that you will bless her and her family at this time of transition. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And lastly, we pray for ourselves. We use the words of the general thanksgiving as we commit ourselves to serving our loving Lord. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your humble servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honour and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Amen. We come now to our Bible reading. It's from Matthew chapter 28, beginning at verse 16. And I'm reading it from the English Standard Version, anglicised version of that. Matthew 28, verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, do keep your Bibles open at Matthew 28, verses 16 onwards. We're looking at those verses under the title, The Great Commission, The Great Commission. And this is basically where Jesus appears, he's risen from the dead, and where he sends out his disciples to spread the good news across the world. And of course, across the world this uh, last week, uh, just as the weekend uh, approached, uh, we have been receiving the sad news of the death of His Royal Highness Prince Philip, uh, consort to Her Majesty the Queen. And I know our thoughts are very much, and our prayers are very much uh, with the family as they grieve the loss of uh, their father and husband and grandfather. I actually um, uh, met Prince Philip once um, when I was working as a kitchen porter at Sandringham House 
on a very, very cold uh, Christmas. Um, I was actually um, carrying a, a saucepan uh, across the kitchen and um, I came onto this, I sort of stepped onto this, just this slight touch of grease on the floor and I slipped and I nearly fell over, but I just managed to recover myself and remain upright. And he was in the kitchen at the time. And I just turned around and I just caught his eye and he saw me slip and then keep my balance. And he, 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 he didn't say a word. He just looked at me and he grinned. But you know, it was, it was a really friendly grin. It was a kind of well done for staying on your feet kind of grin. And it's interesting how as more details have come out about his life, including his distinguished wartime service, I wonder if he, he grinned at perhaps uh, some ratings on the deck of a warship as they kept their balance maybe in a storm or two. Um, anyway, that's my, my contact. He didn't actually say a word, but he said an awful lot through his smile. Here though in this passage, Jesus does say words. He does speak. And this is a message which is going to reverberate as good news right across the world. It's often called the Great Commission, but I want to look at it in two ways. I want to look, first of all, at what I'm going to term the Great Transformation. How Jesus changes people for the good so that they can do the amazing things that he's asking them to do in these verses. And then I'm going to talk about the Great Adventure, what he calls us to do for him. First, the Great Transformation. Jesus teaches the disciples to obey. Verse 16, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Uh, this is responding to the instruction that Jesus had previously given them in verse 10 of the same chapter, um, when Jesus says to the women outside the tomb, go and tell my brothers to, Gal to go to Galilee and there they will see me. The journey to Galilee would take three days. It was a journey of over 90 miles. It was literally from one end of the country to the other. And these were disciples that Jesus had rebuked in Matthew 26 for sleeping on the job. In verse 40 of that chapter, um, we read these words, Could you not watch with me one hour? This is the disciples in Gethsemane. Three times they ignored Jesus' instructions to remain awake and prayerful. And here they are, they're being told to walk three days and climb a mountain to see the risen Lord. This is a significant correction to their energy levels. We may want a mountaintop experience of the presence of Jesus, but note these disciples only get that mountaintop experience when they've obeyed his instruction to walk for three solid days and then climb that mountain. We've really got to obey Jesus, haven't we, if we want to get anywhere as a Christian. Imagine if the disciples said, we're not going there. We're still too tired. Let's go to the Mount of Olives, just round the corner. It's much closer and it's much more spiritual. They would have missed out on everything that Jesus was going to say and tell them to do. Obedience is not optional for the follower of Christ. And secondly, within this great transformation, Jesus teaches the disciples to worship him, to worship him. Uh, the sports writer uh, Martin Johnson was uh, famously cruel about the sporting performance of the England cricket team. Uh, during one disastrous cricketing tour, he said, there are only three things wrong with the England cricket team. They can't bat, they can't bowl, and they can't field. On one disastrous Ashes tour, he said, it is a touching act of faith if the England batsman bothers to put on sunscreen. Well, what is the state of the disciples' act of faith? Is it a touching act of faith or something else? Verse 17, and when they saw him, that is the risen Lord, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Well, what do you make of this? The risen Lord appears to them physically. Physically, he stands before them, and they still do not believe, some of them. Well, I don't know, I find myself making excuses for them because I see something in them which reminds me of myself and makes me feel a bit uncomfortable. I think we learn something about faith here. There are some people for whom no level of proof is enough. In Luke 16, Jesus tells one of the most challenging parables he ever told. Luke 16, verse 19, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, who feasted sumptuously every day. 
And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, and Lazarus in like manner had bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. Besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not do so, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send into my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they come also into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Now, if some of the disciples were in a state of unbelief, it appears that Jesus was gracious to them. He allows them to be within the worshipping community, to take the time that they needed to come to a full understanding of the resurrection. But perhaps there is a difference between them and this man and this parable. Maybe the disciples did accept Moses and the prophets. We certainly believe they did. They just needed to take that final step and accept Christ. And it's interesting, with all that doubt and confusion amongst the group of disciples, Jesus still puts them to work as a collective body of people for him. And I think that's true today, isn't it? We're a mixed bag, aren't we? Some of us have strong faith. Some of us have weak faith. Some of us are weave in and out of worship and doubt for years. We may be clinging on to our faith by a thread amidst personal tragedy or uh, mental health or, or physical challenges. But we have important work to do for God. And if we wait till we're completely sorted out spiritually, we'll never start it. The task is urgent. He's calling us to go. Why wait anymore? Let's get on with serving God. So we've looked at the great transformation, how God takes us as we are with our doubts and fears and changes us, helps us to be obedient. That's the first step, isn't it, really, to the great adventure to which he calls us. What is this great adventure? Well, the great adventure is a mission. It's the mission of the church family to share the good news of repentance and faith in the risen Lord for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life. And the great adventure is based on four things. First of all, all authority, all authority being vested, invested in Jesus Christ. When I was in business, a charity client of mine organized a big fundraising bike ride across Russia. And I flew out to Moscow to organize the press and TV coverage in Red Square. And all the riders rode in on their bikes, you know, a huge crowd of them, and all the media were there. There was just one problem, how to gather the riders for a photo shoot. And I quickly realized that the riders were in no mood to listen to me. So I turned to the one man who could help me, the leader of the ride. One call from him and they stopped and they formed up and we got this great picture of all these riders in, fam in front of the famous onion domes. They'd been listening to this man's voice for three weeks. He guided them, he protected them. It was like they were his sheep and he was their shepherd. He'd earned his authority. I was just one of the suits that had flown in from London. And the basis of the great adventure that we're called on to embark on as a church family is the authority of Jesus Christ. He has earned it. Verse 18, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore. How could anyone resist such an instruction? How could anyone imagine that they could create for themselves a more fulfilling life outside the will of God than that of the will of God itself? In Acts 4, Peter stands before the great council of rulers and scribes and Pharisees in Jerusalem. 
Um, they had queried by what power he had healed a crippled man. And with the whole political and religious establishment before him, Peter says this, verse 10, Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So when Jesus calls us to join this great adventure of spreading the good news across the world, it is based on him having all the power, all the power. When we step forward in obedience to his will, when we want to bless the people we're trying to bless in our parish and in the world, we can draw on him. He has all the power. The second thing about our great adventure is uh, it's based on all people, all people. The world is our congregation. I've been reading about one of my heroes, David Wilkinson, this week. He did amazing work bringing Christ to the gangs of New York. I mentioned him last uh, week in my evening talk, but I've discovered some new stuff on him since. He had an amazing experience of the supernatural power of God in his ministry. One time he was leading a mission in Brazil and he was taken in for questioning by the authorities. He had such a detailed knowledge of the drug abuse in the country that the authorities were convinced there'd been a security leak. Uh, but there had not been. Uh, David explained that God had revealed these things to him in prayer. He really believed in God's ability to reach all people. Two journalists investigating him said his eyes, his personality, his commitment, his intense love for people he was talking to, the word that comes to mind is fearless. He confronted gang members and other unsavory types with great courage. They continued, he just read them the riot act, telling them that God loved them and that he would love them. On investigation, they found every supernatural story of conversions and deliverance and transformed lives to be true. If anything, they'd been underreported. One outdoor gospel meeting that David Wilkinson had claimed had attracted 300 people was checked, and police reports at the time revealed that in the police uh, uh, records, the number attending was over 500. The journalist said, we concluded that the heart of the story was the power of the Holy Spirit to move into the world right now and change things. Here is how the blessing of all nations is described in our passage, verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. When Jesus said all nations, this was revolutionary for the disciples. They thought that salvation was just for the Jews, but that was never the plan. In uh, Genesis 18, verse 16, Abraham receives a divine uh, visitation from angels. And we read these words, the men, that is the angels, set out from there and they looked down towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to set them on their way. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? In that context, looking at the, all the horrors that were about to take place in Sodom, God plans to bless the world. And the message is clear. When God says all nations, nobody is beyond the reach of God's power. I think there are two exciting developments in our parish that kind of reflect that. We've discovered when we were knocking on doors in the parish before the, the pandemic, and of course prior to the pandemic and once the pandemic ceases, we will be knocking on the doors as we have done in the past, knocking on every door in the parish uh, every two years. And we discovered it when we were in our recent door knocking that our parish is becoming more diverse and more international uh, with every passing day. Um, all nations are on our doorstep right here in Chorley Wood. And also through our parish and through the people in it, we have connections all over the world. 
God has also been active during the pandemic. The pandemic has forced the church to go online. In one year, we've been forced to kind of go for a technological development, which would perhaps taken us up to 10 years to achieve. And our Zoom Alpha course during the pandemic has more people on it than our Inquirer courses used to have on Thursday nights before the pandemic. In physical terms, God has brought the world to our door. And in technological terms, God has taken our door to the world and opened it so that others may see and hear the good news. Thirdly, all truth, all truth. Verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Early this year, um, it was uh, kind of um, uh, Easter time, wasn't it? And um, for our, our family, Easter time is always a great time of celebration. We always get together as much as we can. And uh, we celebrate, of course, new life in Christ. Um, we had a great outdoor service in the sunshine, which was fabulous. Um, Easter for us as a family also was a time when I think we nearly killed ourselves with eating too much chocolate. Um, when we get a, a box of chocolate as a family, there are ones that go really quickly. And then there are the ones that are left. I like the last children to be picked for a football team. And the kids never eat the sort of chocolate flavored ones. Uh, and when they were very young, what they would do is they'd pick up one of those chocolate flavored, sorry, the, the, not chocolate flavored, the, the coffee flavored ones. They're the ones they leave. They'd pick up one of these coffee flavored ones and they'd take a quick bite. And they'd go, ugh. And they'd put it back just in case you wanted a half chewed coffee flavored chocolate. And it had teeth marks on it. And because they were little, they were tiny little teeth marks. Like the, the chocolate had been chewed by a rat. It was not a good look. Now, when Jesus says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, he means everything. We can't look at the Bible and say, oh, I'm going to, I like that bit, but I don't like that bit. We have to talk about sensitive issues as they come up in an appropriate way. We have to talk about judgment. We have to talk about repentance. We have to talk about the big three, money, sex, and power. We have to talk about the work of the Holy Spirit today. He's essential. Um, we have to talk about all kinds of issues. In fact, we're starting a series tonight in our 6.30 service on the Holy Spirit. Do join us online and in person. Lastly, always. All power, all people, all truth, always. This life is fleeting, isn't it? We've certainly seen that this week, haven't we? In the news that the uh, royal family has received, but also on our television screens, at scenes of bloodshed in Myanmar and other places. It's also fragile, isn't it? Someone wrote, life is fragile, handle with prayer. Do you believe that Christ is with us always as we follow him in obedient discipleship? One of the most inspiring people I've ever met was Dr. Sasa of the Christian charity Health and Hope. He is now a UN special envoy for Myanmar. And you'll have seen huge violence in Myanmar on our television screens this week following the military coup. Uh, he has opposed it and been charged with treason in absentia. Speaking from an undisclosed location, Dr. Sasa said this, the military are trying to kill as many people as possible. We are very close to a civil war. Our, peace, our peaceful movement is more powerful than their violence. Do you believe that God is with you forever? Dr. Sasser does. Whatever the future holds for him, he is trusting in him. He believes that Jesus has all the power. Do you believe that God is with you? And that as you follow him in faith and obedience, and as you hold his hand, he will hold your hand through this life and into eternity. If so, accept your part in the Great Commission. And so as I conclude, the children of Greek Oak Church of England Primary School uh, in Surrey uh, rewrote uh, this beautiful version of the Lord's Prayer in simple language. It, it beautifully captures what it means to follow the Great Commission, allowing God in us to make the great transformation, joining him in the great adventure as Jesus leads us with all authority to witness to all people all truth, always. So as I close, and as we perhaps come to God ourselves, as we must come as children, let us receive 
this children's prayer, this version of the Lord's Prayer done by children, perhaps with our eyes closed. You may even quietly want to open your hands to God. No one else will see but you. Maybe that's a nice gesture as our new adventure begins. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, you are awesome. Show us who you are and how you want us to be. Make earth more like heaven. Please give us what we need to keep going each day. Help us to know when we are wrong and clean us up on the inside. Help us to let other people off and move on. Keep us safe from the bad stuff. You're in charge. You're strong and powerful and always there, forever. Amazing. Amen. Well, in a moment, we'll be coming to our final song. 
in which we take our offering to support the work and witness of the church family in this parish and further afield with our mission partners. Thank you so much for joining us today, wherever you are, here in, here in Chorley Wood or across the globe. And do stay online for a few moments for a cyber copy. If you have a uh, Facebook or a YouTube account, why don't you send some greetings or best wishes or encouragements or some spiritual thoughts to each other. And before our final song, a closing blessing, taken from Ephesians chapter 3. May the God of his glorious riches strengthen us with power through the Spirit in our inner being, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, and we can be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>